Um, so this has been a fantastic conference. Thanks for everyone who's attended. I, I myself, I'm getting a ton out of this, just listening to the talks and stimulating a lot of thought. I was pretty nervous coming up because I got 20 minutes to talk about degenerative spine, and it's pretty much the only 20 minutes we're going to talk about degen, except for the breakout sessions. And it's, you know, everything we've been doing and talking about has really been in deformity and improving outcomes for these deformity patients, the sick, the elderly. But the reality is, I was trying to kind of set myself aside as I was coming up. I was thinking, how can I tell people I'm a deformity surgeon, so this really isn't my bag, and, but I'm still going to talk to you about it. The reality is, when you look at a patient with L5-S1 degeneration, facet arthrosis, discite loss, collapse, that patient comes into the office and they've lost lordosis. They have a focal loss of lordosis at L5-S1. And what we've done in spine is we've set it aside and we've said, well, that's a degenerative condition, not a deformity. You're just treating the degen disease. If you do a fusion and decompress the nerve roots, they're going to do really well. And the truth is they do. In fact, for a long time, all we've ever done is decompress the nerves, fuse the patient in a position, and for five to 10 years, they do fantastic until they come in because we have to treat L4-5. But maybe it's time we stop separating and calling ourselves deformity surgeons and degen surgeons, and we start looking at this as focal deformity in a degenerative case and global deformity in a deformity case. So I'm gonna try and now in the 18 minutes I have left, those were my disclosures, talk to you guys about how we think about this and try and tell a story. I don't want to get in the weeds about how we plan lumbar lordosis, but just so you guys know where I come up with the number for lordosis for this case, we've gone through the more recent literature, we've come up with this equation for ourselves, which is PI divided by 2 plus 28. It's a little less aggressive than Mike Kelly, who does uh, PI times 0.6 plus 30, I believe. There's other literature from Korea and Japan that shows some different equations. That's not the point. So lumbar lordosis for this patient should be 56 degrees. This is a patient that came to us after multiple surgeries. I can separate myself and say we didn't do this, but the reality is I've done degen surgeries and I've made this patient before in my, my practice. So if you look at this patient, I'm not even showing you the top where they have proximal junctional kyphosis and a fracture, and they actually have a, a progressive kyphosis through the thoracic spine. We're just going to look at the lumbar spine. If you look at the bottom, you see what looks like probably an allograft uh, spacer, which was probably placed from anterior. So this patient went into a surgeon at one point in time. They had some radicular symptoms in L5. They had degenerative disc disease and collapse, and the surgeon said, okay, I can, I can treat this. I'm going to do an L5-S1 anterior posterior. And that's what they get. And if we look at the lordosis goals for this patient, and we start to, whatever numbers, again, I don't care that, you, that we have the numbers down yet, but I do care that we start to focus on them. So let's say it's this, this two-thirds, that's 66% or somewhere in there. 65% of the lordosis should be from L4 to S1. It should be 36 degrees. Well, I can already tell you that L5-S1 is not anywhere close to where it should be. The patient had the L5-S1 fusion. They were fused in a little bit of a flat position. They lost some of the lordosis. They had a four or five. They came back to the surgeon. They said, hey, now I'm having some more pain and some ridiculous symptoms. Surgeon said, let's take you up to L3. So they take him back and do another surgery. Patient gets taken up to L3. And if you look, they have 19 degrees of lordosis from L4 to S1. They have a total of 27.5 degrees of lordosis from L3 to S1, where they should have 47.6. Already, this patient, through two surgeries, which gave them significant relief and probably improved their ODI and gave them a better outcome, just based on pro scores that we would look at, this patient is set up to come to our office eventually to have a T4 to the pelvis with two PSOs. We could have avoided that. We could have thought about the lordosis, not just decompressing the neural elements and fusing this patient. And that's where we have to get away from this idea that there are deformity surgeons and there are degen surgeons. This patient already had a deformity before the first surgery when they had the L5-S1 disease. Someone else decided to take them up one more level. They tried to restore lordosis. They only got them to 35. They needed 53. They got a standalone L1-2 lateral, 39 degrees of lordosis. They're supposed to have 56 L1 to S1. They have 39 degrees of lordosis. What's this patient get now? Well, now they're not just getting the T10 of the pelvis, but they come in with a junctional kyphosis, and we're doing a massive surgery. This failure was driven by the lack of appropriate lordosis in the first surgery at L5-S1. So we've got to stop thinking about ourselves as degen surgeons and deformity surgeons. We're all treating deformity. It's either a focal deformity at L5-S1 or L4-5, 
or as a global deformity throughout the spine because of something else. Is there evidence to support what I'm saying? Well, there absolutely is. If you look at Levesque, this multi-center cohort, they looked at patients who were undergoing degenerative spinal fusions, and they looked at them from the kind of the deformity parameter standpoints. 28% of patients were malaligned after a short segment fusion. So over one-fifth of the patients, we're talking about over a quarter of the patients are actually malaligned after they undergo one or two level degenerative procedures. And 7% of that population was actually aligned prior to the surgery. So not only are we not recognizing malalignment and correcting it, we're actually creating malalignment in our patients. So as part of this story, we were putting in rods starting in 2014 for deformity cases, and I said, hey, why don't we try using these rods for the degen cases? The magic wasn't in the rods. I'm going to show you why I think the rods are important. But the magic was in the planning. Because the reality is, the amount of time that we spent thinking about a deformity surgery, how do we correct the SVA? How do we get the PI minus LL to match? How do we, whatever the parameters were, how do we adapt a spine that's in a sagittal malalignment or coronal malalignment and get it into the appropriate alignment? And we have all these numbers and all these thought processes that we went through, but we weren't doing that for our degen surgeries. I'd go do a degen surgery and I'd go, oh, I'm going to do a 5-1 posterior with a T lift. I don't need to worry about it. I'm, I'll get the proper al alignment. Why do I need to plan this surgery out? The evidence was all showing that we do need to plan the surgery. So we went and started utilizing the rods, and when we took our 50, first 50 patients where we utilized these rods, and again, this is not about the rods as much as it is the planning, the rods. It's the entire suite. It's the entire system. It's thinking about your surgeries. It's looking at your results. It's what Dr. Oyoung talked about, improving based on what you can find or what you see with your, your outcomes. And so when we looked, we overall were better in every category compared to this multi-center study that Levesque had put together. And I'm not saying that we're better surgeons. What I'm saying is I think that the planning and the thought process that went into this and then the rods actually made a difference. If you look, one of the most important ones was the number of patients that we left not corrected was only 4% compared to 21%. Another way of looking at this is in kind of this bar graph representation, how many people did we actually improve? How many people did we take from malaligned to aligned? We were over 14%. We were at 14% for that compared to 2.1% in this large multi-center study. So certainly to us, the planning and the rods have some benefit. There's got to be something to this. I'd be remiss if I don't talk to you about this because this is now just my scientific mind geeking out. I, I, after we started getting these rods, I said, I look at the rods and I said, well, man, the curvature on these rods is completely different than anything I've ever seen coming out of a tray. So I said, what's the radius of curvature of a rod that comes out of a tray that Medtronic gives you, that any competitive company gives you? And I went back and I started asking the manufacturers. I said, why did you guys pick pre-contoured rods of this radius? I've never had an answer to that. Every time I ask a crowd, no one knows the answer. Why do we have the radius of curvature in a pre-bent rod out of a degenerative tray that's 125 to 135 millimeters? No one knows. It is clearly not enough, and especially if we're talking about distributing 60 to 70% of our lordosis from L4 to S1. In fact, if you look at it the way it looks, that was one of our first L5 to S1 rods. That was one of our larger constructs. I think that was actually an L3 to S1. And those are the rods compared to the off-the-shelf, out-of-the-tray rods that are available to us as surgeons. Now, you're going to say, well, yeah, that's fine, but I don't just put the rod in out of the tray. Or maybe you do. And then you say, well, the tulip heads help me. But the studies don't show that. The studies show that we're still not achieving the appropriate correction for these cases. We went on because I really wanted to know a little bit more about the radius of curvature in these rods that we were putting in. You see that rod, we actually tried to bend to that same contour, and we reached the limits of the French benders before we could actually bend to the contour of that rod. We also couldn't do it with the plate benders or anything else, so all of a sudden we have rods that we can't even manufacture in the operating room. Forget the question of whether or not you think you can bend it appropriately. If you can't even get the appropriate alignment of that rod because the French benders and the other tools you have don't allow it, what are we even talking about? We went through and we looked at the radius of curvature of those rods, and lo and behold, the rods that we were ordering, and this should make sense to everyone, they fit the pattern of the spine that everybody was discussing in the meetings. In other words, 
If you looked at rods that went in from L4 to S1, the radius of curvature was on average 59. Radius of curvature, just to remind you, low, uh, low radius means high curve. The rod's really bent. So the lower the radius, the more bend in the rod. We could see a difference between the rods from L4 to S1 compared to any rod that spanned the spine from L4 up. And that radius of curvature was pretty significantly different. In other words, the majority of lordosis is from L4 to S1. That reached statistical significance, and even in the upper portion of the spine, L1 to L4, the radius of curvature was higher than what you could pull off of the shelf. So I know it's a bunch of scientific data and I'm geeking out about it, but the reality is what I'm telling you is everything that we are saying and seeing from radiographic analysis is showing up in the rods as well. And this, this should at least make you think, okay, if, the two, if, if we have a bunch of patients that are coming out malaligned, we're treating iatrogenic flat back and all of these problems, maybe the rod's not the solution, but the rod's part of the solution, and it goes along with the planning and the rest of the stuff that I think we should do as spine surgeons. So what it told us was that the radius of curvature matters, and maybe these rods can actually help. And that's not the end of the story. So we like to continue to learn and push ourselves, and we also like to look at our results because they're right there in front of us. Unfortunately, the platform gives us these results, and we keep seeing how much we fail at producing the appropriate alignment. Um, so we, we went through and we said, okay, what else can we do to improve our outcomes in these patients? One of the things we thought about was where we put the screws. So if we're going to use a, a rod in a fixed position, maybe that rod needs to go to a, a, a more fixed screw, like a monoaxial screw or, in our case, a fixed connector. So we started changing up to that, and we saw some incremental improvements in our outcomes. But then we said, well, this is all great, but is the rod the thing that's always driving the outcomes? What about cages? We're putting in cages all over the place, T-lifts, O-lifts, A-lifts. We need to be able to plan our cages better as well. And so we started working on that as well. And that leads me to this case. So I know we talk about spondylolisthesis as a focal deformity. I know it's one of those subgroups within the SRS. I'll show you another case that's not a focal deformity in, this, in the typical thought process, but this case, I think, needs as much planning and thought as any T10 to the pelvis or T4 to the pelvis. And so where we've got to is we now plan specific inner body heights, lordosis, correction of the spondy, you can actually see on that plan that they've translated L4 on L5, planning our correction or planning our reduction of the spondylolisthesis. So we're putting all of this into the thought process now and we're saying, okay, how can we achieve alignment goals? The, you can see the post-op image. This was done anterior and then perk posterior with an MIS rod. And if we look at the alignment parameters, Again, just reinforcing that this was a focal deformity. This patient's PT was 36 pre-op. We planned it to come back to 27. The patient ended at 24. There was a significant change in the pelvic tilt in a single level fusion. That 100% informs the fact that this was a deformity surgery and that by doing the surgery appropriately, we corrected the deformity. You can see things like the PI minus LL. Now, that PI minus LL is still off. It's not within the plus or minus 10. I think this also describes some of the phenomenon that we don't know everything, that we're still trying to figure this out, that there are a lot of things that are specific to a patient, not a formula. But the distribution of the lordosis, we improved distribution, we improved the overall L1 to L4 lordosis. And going back, if you look at that patient in a long-standing EOS, that looks like a very well-balanced spine. Now, to stand on my soapbox for a second, I probably will never be able to prove to you that appropriate alignment for that patient will decrease the chances of an L5-S1 or an L3-4 fusion. But if I'm honest with you, there's not a single thing that we ever did in orthopedic training where we took a malaligned limb and we left it malaligned. We corrected everything. We corrected deformities in the tibia and the femur. We corrected acetabular deformities. We did periacetabular osteotomies. Total knee arthroplasty. We never put a valgus knee in or a varus knee in. We corrected the malalignment. So I don't understand why we wouldn't correct the malalignment in the spine and think about it and understand from all of the other literature that we know, at least from the biomechanics background of orthopedics, that correcting alignment is more important probably than almost anything else. I think I have enough time. Yeah, we're looking good. So what about this case? This patient 
You get to see the results before I show you the measurements. But this patient has an SVA of 90. Lumbar lordosis is 43. Our mismatch is 18. This patient has a pelvic tilt of 25. So this is a case that looks like a deformity. If we look at what's going on with this patient, there's an, uh, a sacralized lumbar vertebra. There's a 5-1 spondy, a 4-5 degenerative disc disease and collapse, trace spondy, 3-4 degenerative disease collapse and spondy, or no spondy, but foraminal stenosis, radicular symptoms, and the patient has an SVA of 9. Do I need to do a T10 to the pelvis, or can I treat this patient by treating the degenerative symptoms and the pathology, treating the spondy, treating their, their leg pain and radicular symptoms and the back pain that I know are coming from the lower levels of the lumbar spine, and can I achieve appropriate alignment in this case? And if you look, we plan out three levels, anterior, we're planning correction, reducing the spondy, restoring height, getting foraminal height back so that we can restore uh, or remove the nerve symptoms. And in doing this case, we actually can correct in three levels all of the deformity, all of the malalignment, right? So pelvic tilt comes back to 17 at this in this patient. We restore lumbar lordosis to 57. If I use my numbers, one half of uh, 60 is 30 plus 28, 58. So my actual restoration of lordosis is where I want it to be. The PI minus LL drops to four. T1PA, we don't get a C because I didn't have a full standing. But if you look at the overall alignment, you can see where this patient's hips sit in relationship to the rest of the body. You can see where this patient's spine is taking off. So again, this patient didn't need a T10 to the pelvis. They just needed appropriate alignment through the three levels of the lumbar spine that were degenerative. And I would argue that this was a deformity. I think everybody would see this as a deformity case. But I think, again, we have to come back to this mentality that deformity surgery is not just performed by the deformity surgeons. Deformity surgery is performed by every spine surgeon every day. And if we can get that mentality, then we're going to be able to serve our patients much better in the future. And I think I'm over time on that, so I won't go any further. Thank you.